we're going to look at a few example problems of proofs using the epsilon delta definition of limit. Before we do them, I want to just say that this is going to be probably one of the most difficult things you do this semester in this course. That doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, but that does mean it's okay to feel like the very first time you do one of these, you're struggling a little bit to understand how to handle this. So keep at it, look at some more examples, ask for help if you need it. All right, so whenever we start a proof, we want to make sure that we identify that's what we're doing. So I usually write proof at the beginning. All right, since we're using the epsilon delta definition, we need to make sure that the structure of our proof follows the structure of that definition. So that definition says that for every epsilon, we're able to find a delta that makes a certain implication true. So we need to start here with just some arbitrary epsilon that we would assume is given. So when I leave it arbitrary like this, what that means is that if this proof is true, it's going to hold for any epsilon that is greater than zero. And that's what that definition says, for any epsilon greater than zero. All right, and then we need to figure out a delta that's going to work. And in our proof, we're going to show what is the delta that we're going to use. And then we're going to show that that works. So I'm going to leave a little blank right there. I'm going to kind of just put a little space, highlighted space right there. To, we're going to come back and fill that in in a minute. Um, the structure of these proofs is generally the same. We start with this beginning that's the beginning of the definition. For every epsilon, there is a delta. So in my proof, I'm saying for whatever epsilon you have, I'm going to write down a delta. And then we would like to show that the inequalities uh, in that definition, follow the implication in the definition. So one of the important things is to make sure that the order is correct. In that definition, it says that 0 being less than x minus a, in this problem our a is 4, less than delta, should imply that the absolute value of the function minus L is less than epsilon. So we need to make sure that we follow the direction of that implication. We want to start with this inequality about delta, and we want to show eventually that that implies the statement we want about epsilon. So I'm going to just kind of fill in for this one where we should end up. Where we should end up at the end of our work here is the inequality that we want to have about epsilon, right, f of x minus l, absolute value of all that is less than epsilon. So my goal here really is just to kind of connect the steps in the middle, so sort of like I left a blank up at the top, I'm also going to leave kind of a blank here in the middle where I just highlighted some yellow, and really what I need to do is fill in those steps. Now certainly there are harder proofs that you might come across where there's a lot more um, complicated logic in the proof, but for the ones we're going to do for this class, for the most part, these are kind of the key steps. So I've really got kind of a skeleton of the proof here, the beginning, a uh, little bit of the first couple lines, the end. I probably should have a concluding statement at the very end, but I've got kind of a skeleton of the proof here. Okay, um, when you do a proof, a lot of times it looks clean and the logic should flow in the right direction, but that doesn't mean that there wasn't some scratch work done. So I'm going to go over here and do a little scratch work. And this is a lot like what we did on the other problems where we were given an epsilon and we had to find a delta that would make it work. All right, so um, what I want at the end is to have the absolute value of 7 minus 2, 7x minus 2, minus 26 being less than epsilon. So just like those other problems, I'm going to work a little bit on that and figure out what it is that I might use for my delta that would make this work. Keeping in mind that really what I eventually want is to have negative delta being less than x minus 4 less than delta, which is the uh, delta inequality um, in the proof. 
All right, so you might be able to see on this one, actually, that if I just go ahead and divide by 7, I get what I'm after here. Okay, so this is my scratch work, but that helps me figure out what to use in the actual proof for my delta. All right, so it's important that you understand that the stuff that I wrote off to the side here is scratch work, uh, and the proof needs to go in the right direction. Okay, so I'm going to erase these yellow things that I have here, and we'll just fill in what should go there. Okay, so we're going to let delta be epsilon over 7. I got that from my scratch work over to the side. Now for the proof, I need to make sure that the direction of implication goes the right way. So I want to start with this delta statement and I want to end up with the epsilon statement. Um, for this one, one of the things I might do next is go ahead and replace the delta with what I claimed it is, epsilon over 7. All right, so all I did in that step was to replace the delta in the step before with the epsilon over 7 that I had in the step before that. Okay, and then from here, I'm going to have some algebra to do. There's several different ways you can do that algebra. Essentially, your scratch work over to the side has the key steps of the algebra, and so you can maybe kind of rewrite that a little bit backwards in your proof, or maybe do the algebra in a slightly different way, but um, it's important that the algebra in your proof follows the right direction of implication. So I need to connect each step to the step before that. All right, so in this problem, I'm actually going to just go ahead and multiply both sides of my inequality through by 7. So I will have 7 times the absolute value of x minus 4 is less than epsilon. And then since 7 is a positive number, I can go ahead and bring that inside the absolute value. Multiplying inside an absolute value by a positive number won't change anything. Uh, and then if I distribute through my 7, I get 7x minus 28 inside the absolute value. And then that connects very nicely with where I wanted to end up. I can separate the minus 28 term into a minus 2 and a minus 26. I want to make sure that I separate that into the f of x and the l. All right, so I now have all the key parts of the proof. I probably should have a concluding statement at the end. I'm going to go ahead and box off my scratch work here so that I can write a concluding statement of my proof after the period I have here. All right, so I'm going to say, uh, since we did this for an arbitrary epsilon, we didn't pick a specific epsilon, We've shown that this works for any epsilon, and therefore we've shown what we were trying to show. All right, sometimes people at the end of their proofs write QED. That means quad erat demonstratum. Thus, it is shown. All right, so um, it's important to have a few key parts of this. Uh, certainly, uh, the let epsilon greater than zero be given should be at the beginning of the proof. You need to state what your delta is going to be. That delta is always going to be given in terms of epsilon. All right, you need to start with the inequality from the definition that has the deltas in it, and then you need to follow that implication through until you end up with a statement at the end that you're supposed to have at the end of that definition. So the parts I highlighted here are all key to this. The algebra in the middle that I did not highlight is going to be different, different times, but the main structure of the proof is always going to be pretty much the same every time. We're going to look at one more example that's not for a specific function, but that actually proves one of those theorems that we've been using about functions and how we can evaluate limits of functions. All right, for this proof, we're actually going to have to use an inequality that was in the absolute value stuff we reviewed at the beginning. I'm going to write that over here to the side. Uh, that inequality says that the absolute value of a sum of two values is less than or equal to uh, each of those absolute values separately added together. Um, so this is called triangle inequality.
Okay, so I'm going to start the proof pretty much the same way I did before. So we're going to say let epsilon greater than zero be given. And a few lines down, I am going to state what I want delta to be. But actually, I have these two functions here. So I'm going to have to do a little bit of work with those to figure out what my delta is going to be. Um, since we know that the limit as x approaches a of f of x exists and is a number, then that must satisfy that definition. So there has to be a delta for that function. And we'll actually have a delta for the other function, so I'm going to call this a delta 1. That delta 1 will have to be greater than 0, of course. Uh, so there must be a delta greater than 0 such that the definition is going to hold for this f of x function. So 0 less than absolute value of x minus a less than delta 1 is going to force that f of x function to be within epsilon units of L. All right, and then we're essentially going to have the same thing for our g of x function. So since the limit as x approaches a of g of x is equal to some other number, m, that one must have a delta 2. It might not be the same delta, though, so we'll call it delta 2. Okay, so actually, no matter what epsilon I have, I can always choose a delta that's going to work for these problems. So I'm going to do a little thing here that might at first seem weird, but if this statement about f of x is true for every epsilon, then it's also true for every smaller epsilon. So because I have these two functions, I need to do a little adjustment here uh, that this statement would be true not only for epsilon, but also for half of epsilon. Okay, so now we're kind of ready to go back to the main structure of the usual proof here. Uh, so we're going to let our delta that's going to work for what we're trying to show be the smaller of those two deltas of delta 1 and delta 2. Okay, so if I have delta being the smaller of those two, then I can say that uh, when x is within delta units of a, that both of those other inequalities will be true. Okay, so that's not exactly what I want to prove, though. Um, but I can then use triangle inequality to look at the sum of those two things. Okay, so now I can attack the statement I'm actually trying to show. What I'm actually going to write down here, first of all, is sort of the left-hand side of triangle inequality with f of x minus l as my a and g of x minus m as my b. So that matches kind of the beginning that I have over here of triangle inequality. Um, all right, so I can then use triangle inequality to rewrite the right-hand side. So I'm just using triangle inequality. All right, so I'm now going to just do a little bit of rearranging here on the left inequality that I have here, if I rewrite those terms in a different order and maybe factor out the minus sign from the last two terms, I get f of x plus g of x minus l plus m, minus the quantity l plus m. All right, and then what I have here on the right side is this f of x minus l, which I know absolute value of f of x minus l is less than epsilon over 2. And I also have a g of x minus m absolute value of that. And I know that that is also less than epsilon over 2. So I can say that this right hand side is less than epsilon over 2 plus epsilon over 2. Okay, so that basically gives us what I want to show. Uh, I'm going to put a little extra brackets in here just to make everything look like it does in the statement of what we were supposed to prove. All right, so in the statement of what we were supposed to prove, we were supposed to show that the limit as x approaches a of the f of x plus g of x 
that's here, uh, approaches the sum L plus M, that's here. And so we have that the absolute value of that function sum minus what we're claiming the limit is, is less than epsilon. All right, so that's how these epsilon delta proofs end. We want to end up with the inequality we were trying to show. So maybe just one concluding statement, period, QED. All right, this is a much harder proof. Uh, I would say that I would not ask a question like this on one of our exams. I would, however, expect you to know that this is really just another epsilon delta proof like the ones you did. The previous problem is one, like I might ask on an exam. But the main point of watching this example and understanding this example is to understand that those theorems that we've been using, this is one of them, all are true and uh, can all be proven using an epsilon delta proof. So they all rest on this logical foundation of this definition. So everything we have about limits really comes back to that definition. That is the main point.